Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, all over the world. Welcome to the Storytelling for Ocean Science and Sustainability webinar. I'm Charlie Fitzpatrick, and I'm Schools Program Manager for ESRI. And I am so excited to be a guest judge for the 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Challenge for Restoring Our Oceans. When I was growing up, I so wanted to be a marine biologist, but that was really tough to do in Minnesota in the center of North America. So I became a geography teacher and then eventually found my way to Esri. So this event just covers so many delights for me. Okay, Ross, hit it. This webinar is part of a larger collaborative effort between ESRI and the National Geographic Society to engage young people in solution finding through GIS and storytelling by encouraging them to join the growing GenGeo movement, a global community of young people with an insatiable drive to seek solutions that build a sustainable future and a thriving planet. ESRI and National Geographic Society are co-hosting this 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Challenge for Restoring Our Ocean, a global competition that encourages high school students, college students, and individuals 18 to 24 to create impactful stories about ocean health. We hope that after this webinar, teachers and our next generation of conservation leaders will be inspired to participate in the 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Ocean Challenge. Open to high school, college students, and young professionals through October 22nd. Today, and hit it Ross, today I am joined by Esri's Story Maps team and my fellow guest judges for this 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Ocean Challenge. So please post down in the comments and the Q&A, particularly in the Q&A, any questions for our speakers go into that Q&A box. Let's get to a rundown on today's discussion. First up will be Dawn Wright, Chief Scientist of ESRI. She's gonna be discussing ocean science and mapping efforts for a sustainable ocean and planet. We're gonna hear more about Dawn in a minute, but let's just keep going with the rest of the team. Next up will be, we'll hear from National Geographic Certified Educator and Emerging Explorer, Sandra Turner. She will share her own ocean story and the GIS tools that she uses and her work on climate education in the classroom and beyond. With a little context of the ocean and the planet there, then we'll have the Esri Story Maps team bring us, they're gonna provide a hands-on ArcGIS Story Maps demo to get you started with digital storytelling. And finally, Alex Tate, the geographer the geographer at the National Geographic will share his extensive experience mapping climate and more through best practices and some sample maps. This is Alex's third year judging the annual Story Maps Challenge. So who better to share the tips and tricks for building your maps and stories? And although our final guest judge, Shelby O'Neill, couldn't be with the webinar today, the winners of the 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Ocean Challenge will spend a little time with Shelby at a virtual meet and greet session. Shelby is a National Geographic Young Explorer and the founder of Junior Ocean Guardians and the No Straw November Challenge. A passionate young ocean advocate She's really excited to read your challenge submissions. So now let's dive into ocean science with Dawn Wright, a specialist in marine geology, geography, and oceanography. 
Dawn has authored and contributed to some of the most definitive literature on marine GIS. She holds way too many prestigious positions and awards to mention, but to us, she's Deep Sea Dawn, a name that she earned after in 1991 being the first black woman to dive to the deep ocean floor in Alvin, a deep sea submersible vehicle. She's an advocate for GIS, the planet and inclusivity, passionate about Legos and Star Wars and her dog, Riley. And she's just an enormous mentor and hero to aspiring scientists and beyond. So over to you, Deep Sea Dawn. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> It is absolutely uh, tremendous to be with you and all of you uh, today. And I'm going to shift over to my screen so we can uh, get going. And what I have been uh, asked to do today is to start off this uh, webinar by covering uh, three major areas for you. Uh, my personal journey into to ocean science and uh, that personal journey includes several of my former colleagues and students, one of which is Michelle Kinzel, who I see uh, in the chat. Hello, Michelle. I'm also going to talk a little bit about ocean science and sustainability in general, uh, some of the threats and some of the initiatives that you will hopefully be telling stories about, and then also touch a little bit on the importance of GIS and storytelling in solving uh, these threats to the ocean, especially through your voices, through your youth, your new voices who will come on the scene to uh, save the day, we hope. So uh, first, a, a little bit about, about me. Uh, I uh, grew up, I've been to Minnesota, <laughs> like Charlie, but I grew up uh, on Maui uh, in Hawaii. And so uh, I was fascinated uh, with maps uh, but I wasn't quite sure if uh, maps or GIS were going to be in my future uh, at that time. Uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about sports. So I was, uh, I was a runner and was hoping to make the 1980 Olympics uh, in the long jump. There was no geographic information systems or GIS then that, that I knew of or that was available in my school. Uh, but I went through my childhood thinking uh, about the ocean, thinking about sports. Uh, I barely wore any shoes, so you can see my bare feet uh, in the photo. In fact, when my coach told me how much faster I could run and jump in shoes, I resisted that. And this is not unlike people who use GIS who resist moving to GIS on the web and resist getting into story maps, but uh, I digress there. The only maps that I knew about were uh, in the book Treasure Island or in the pages of the National Geographic. I really did not get involved in GIS until I was in graduate school. So here I am with a bunch of graduate students getting my PhD at UC Santa Barbara, and that's where things uh, really took off for me. And I ended up doing a lot of uh, traveling around the world. So this is a map of where I've been uh, to sea throughout all of the uh, oceans of the world, uh, especially the Indian Ocean, the Antarctic, and the Western Pacific. A lot of that work was part of my uh, studies uh, leading up to uh, my degrees at Texas A&M University and at UC Santa Barbara but also at Oregon State University, where I ended up doing quite a bit of, of research and teaching in GIS. And uh, that led up to me joining uh, ESRI in 2011 as chief scientist. Now you can see through the, uh, the, the pattern uh, of these dots on the map that uh, there was a lot of activity uh, near the equator. In fact, I had the good fortune to cross the equator several times and thus had the privilege of being part of special ceremonies that we held uh, on at sea for those who were crossing the equator for the first time 
and I'm dressed up here as the dread pirate Davy Jones reading charges against those polywogs who had not yet crossed the equator and that was all in good fun. And I also had the great privilege of uh, taking care of my own graduate students uh, and taking them on deep sea adventures as well. So you can see these pictures here of us uh, visiting the volcanoes and the coral reefs really under uh, American Samoa and working with uh, ocean scientists and some of my students were involved in that. And uh, as was mentioned before, I am a big fan uh, of Lego. So you can see that uh, behind me uh, in, my, in my room here as well. Uh, I see Riley sleeping back there. But I, I still uh, build a lot of Lego, especially ocean themed Lego. And I think it's truly awesome and a great way to, to relax. So I want to pivot now to some of the really serious issues at hand uh, in terms of ocean science and, and sustainability. There, there really isn't time to cover all of that because uh, I only have 20 minutes here, but one view uh, on ocean threats and initiatives and the science that is needed for sustainability was recently summarized in this Washington Post article uh, by yours truly. So you can take a look at that article. It's really short. It's just, uh, it's really just a page and it summarizes some of the, the, uh, the big issues uh, at hand. And one of the things that you will discover uh, as you begin to think about these issues and build your stories around them is that there is what's known as a global geospatial framework. We often call this a nervous system. This is coming to the rescue in terms of many, many uh, organizations and individuals. Uh, everybody is sharing their data sets, uh, sharing their services, their data sets as services, which you'll learn about. And this is dramatically extending the impact of geographic information systems to really solve some of these problems of sustainability using ocean science. And this is really because spatial is special. So you will learn about points and lines and areas, all these observations that come in those different forms. There's photography and videos. Uh, there's other kind of imagery that tell us about the ocean as you see in these spinning globes. But you'll find that that spatial lies at the heart of just about everything that matters to us in the ocean, such as where are we going to establish and enforce additional marine protected areas? Where and how are we going to sustainably feed people with ocean-based protein? Where are we going to address what we see as hot spots of rapidly declining ocean oxygen or places where the ocean is getting more acidic? Where and how are we going to adapt to a changing climate? All of these are spatial issues and they can be addressed via uh, some incredible story maps. And you're going to see some wonderful examples by my colleagues uh, throughout this, this webinar. And one of the things that Esri is doing is that we are partnering with millions of our users, thousands of our business partners, and collaborating with organizations such as the National Geographic and many of these other organizations that you see in yellow to help to build this global framework to solve many of these ocean problems. And a lot of these, a lot of this work is being expressed by way of, of story maps. Just to show you some examples, there is a lot of content that we are producing. You can also think about this as data. Content is another way of saying data. And so there is one major data set that we have produced at Esri in association with the USGS or the US Geological Survey and other organizations. And this content has several story maps associated with it. It's called the Ecological Marine Units and it's a 3D digital ocean that helps us to understand what's going on in the ocean in terms of its oxygen, its salinity, its temperature, and its nutrients. And this is being used to help design new marine protected areas and to understand 
uh, the balance that is needed in ocean ecosystems so, so that we can detect change throughout the world's oceans. There's also a dashboard. That's another way to express data. And this is a dashboard of how healthy the ocean is. This is the Ocean Health Index, which helps us to understand the characteristics and metrics for a healthy ocean so that each of the countries that has an Ocean Health Index score, such as what you see here with Australia's score there, we can help uh, promote sustainable practices through our governments uh, using this Ocean Health Index. And this is the work that uh, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis is doing with Conservation International, with us and with other partners. So that's a dashboard. This is a hub. A hub has dashboards, it has data or content, it has story maps, it has all kinds of resources. And this was put together by the Group on Earth Observations Blue Planet Initiative. Blue Planet is really the coastal and the ocean arm of the Group on Earth Observations. And what it does is it connects ocean and coastal information with society, especially as part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So you'll hear about, I'll talk about that uh, ocean decade uh, in a few minutes. And we have a lot of other examples uh, that we have on the web all the time in this uh, Ocean Science information page, which you can get from our, our science portfolio. So this is where you can go to find out more information, as, as well as to see what we're doing in other areas of, of science uh, at ESRI. Now, I mentioned this UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This is a big deal. This is something that was just launched by the United Nations. It, uh, it was just launched this year, uh, just a couple of month, months ago, in fact, and it will be going all the way until 2030. And the theme of this big initiative with hundreds of countries and organizations involved is the science we need for the ocean we want. So there are all kinds of story maps that are being made right now to talk about what's happening with the ocean decade or how people are contributing to the ocean decade. So you can find out a lot more about that uh, at oceandecade.org. And there is an article that I wrote recently that talks about how ESRI is supporting the UN decade of ocean science. So you can read a bit about that uh, at this, this article in Meteorological Technology International. But one of the more exciting things that we are doing uh, to support the ocean decade is creating a digital twin of the ocean. And the ecological marine units uh, that I showed you about, that 3D digital ocean that you can fly through, that will be part of this digital ocean, digital twins of the ocean called DITTO, a virtual representation uh, of the ocean, but also really more like a sandbox. For those of you who are gamers or who are computer programmers, uh, you know about these virtual worlds that you can build that help you to see what's going on right now, but help you to project what might happen in the future. So that's what this digital twin is about. So we're going beyond just a, 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 a map. We're going beyond just a model, uh, but we're trying to be more predictive with what if scenarios and how is the ocean going to change if we humans do certain activities. So that's what, what DITTO is, is about. And we're involved in that with all of these organizations that you see uh, on this slide. So, so that's going to be a lot of fun and a super, super big effort. And then there's also, and I'm going to, to stop my sharing and switch over to another screen. Another really, really cool effort that I want you guys to really know a lot about and to, to really explore is VCOP. V, so the V stands for virtual. Uh, ECOP is Earth Early Career Ocean Professionals. And this is really the youth movement that is within the UN Ocean Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And this is a story map that these young people put together 
it gives you an overview of their VCOP day. They had one day where they talked about what are the kinds of actions we want to take for the ocean that we want in the future. And so if you explore this story map, you can see all the different types of activities uh, that they had uh, throughout the day. You can also get in touch with this group, and I would encourage all of you to check these guys out. You can go to vcop.net. They tell you here in this introduction what they are all about and how to get involved with them. But they did all kinds of wonderful things during a 24-hour period. They went through all of the major time zones of the world. They had young people from all of these places, all of these markers that you see on the map, giving presentations about what they care about in terms of the ocean, what kinds of things they're doing to protect the ocean, uh, what kinds of science they hope to achieve. Some of them, many of them are students uh, in college, but many of them uh, also work with students who are in high school or students who are in elementary school to do all kinds of really cool projects. Uh, there were, and these are all videos now that you can, that you can access. Some of them also uh, did some activities that were uh, more of a career advancement type. So there were questions and answers with uh, older people uh, like, like me that you can see here where I did a, a conversation to help people to understand where they can go from here as uh, early career ocean professionals. And so this is uh, a story map that I hope you will uh, really enjoy and will really be inspired by. And they put their own uh, dashboard of their activities uh, in, <coughs> excuse me, into, into this uh, dashboard. And they want you to uh, add your own activities. This is a continuing initiative. So this is a wonderful way that you can see how a story map can be used to tell a story, but to also keep an initiative like this uh, going. And so you can add other activities using our survey one, two, three tool. But I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to see that, that wonderful uh, story map uh, as one example. And you're probably wondering how you can get access to many of these uh, initiatives or many of these things that I've shown in my presentation. So it's all, it's all ready for you in a file that you can access. So uh, this is my last slide. And it was wonderful to share this with you. And again, I'm Dawn Wright. I'll be one of the uh, guest judges uh, along with my colleagues here for this challenge. And you can uh, catch me on social media at Deep Sea Dawn. There's my email address. And if you want these slides with all of the information that I shared, you can go to this address, esriurl.com slash Dawn 20 August. And that's how you can you can get to everything that I just shared. So I will we'll stop now so that we can move on to our next guest because I'm really eager to hear from, from Sandra. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to share the same platform with you. Hello, challenge participants. Uh, what an honor to be part of this very important moment with you all and to be here alongside of my fellow judges. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, big shout out to my National Geographic family and Esri family, and to all of the educators who are able to join us uh, this morning, this afternoon. Uh, may your academic year be rich with student achievement and that you have a renewed sense of commitment to the vital profession of teaching. We all know that uh, there are challenges that we are facing, so I um, send warm greetings particularly to you. Like Don said, I am Sandra. I'm a National Geographic Certified Educator and an Emerging Explorer. By professional training, I teach global climate change and ocean science. But before I get into the details of my work, I'd like to share how storytelling and the ocean help to shape the work that I do in the field and also in the classroom. <clears throat> Pardon me, I don't have uh, slides uh, today, but uh, there will be links provided to some of the resources uh, that are mentioned in this presentation. 
I come from a Caribbean culture with a long history of storytelling and from a generation when television uh, just was not common in our homes. My father had a gift for Gab and he was a phenomenal weaver of tales and he used storytell, excuse me, storytelling to actually discipline my eight brothers and I when we were absolutely unruly. As we'd run through the house, my father would stop us in mid-stride and he'd say, sit down, let me tell you a story. And we thought, well, how odd is that? Or how cruel is that to demand that we stop running our children dead? But by the time he twisted his plots and animated characters with song and dance, we softened under the glow of his eyes and we forgot all about the mischief that we had gotten into. And uh, for me, this is when I learned the power of storytelling. Mind you, it was also my father that taught me that uh, we were not allowed to swim past a certain demarcation on the beach. The boundaries were quite clear for him. Uh, and growing up on an island, you know, uh, the island of Jamaica, there's nothing but water around you. And going to the beach was a, a thing that we loved to do as a family. He said that there were sea dragons and monsters waiting to carry us to the bottom of the ocean. And uh, he told us this story so often and so vividly that uh, I still think I can see dragons today in the ocean. Um, but uh, some 20 years later, I broke that tradition and I began to swim largely for discovery and to continue to conquer my fear of sea dragons, each time challenging those boundaries to swim farther and deeper. And in this process, I noticed fantastic rock formations, underwater cliffs and caves, and an incredible coral reef system. I began to appreciate how volcanic matter and coral were the making of islands. And I later learned that coral reef and mangroves were worked as a natural buffer against strong storm surges and hurricanes, and how the impacts of human-induced climate change threatened the ability to provide safe living spaces for people and biodiversity on small developing islands. Pardon me. <clears throat> These discoveries led to my partnerships with marine sanctuaries across the Caribbean on conservation and restoration projects to strengthen our coastal defenses. Over the last five or six years, I began photographing and capturing the stories of people and places across the Caribbean. I then uh, started to bring these experiences into my classroom to, to connect my students with the natural world as a part of our um, sustainability education process. Last year, when I was looking for innovative resources to breathe fresh air into my engagement with students, I found a National Geographic course called Storytelling with Impact in Your Classroom Using Photography. I was quite intrigued by one of the assignments that asked us to use a single image to write about a special place. I wrote about a seemingly abandoned house I stumbled upon while traveling through a small Caribbean island called Cariacou. And then shortly after completing the course, I discovered ArcGIS story maps and created a larger multi, excuse me, multimedia story called The Little House of Hope. From here, I went on to create a collection of other story maps with the inclusion of National Geographic resources. Combined, they work well with my climate, ocean, and field content. With the self-directed lessons that I create with story maps, the story map link is uploaded to my student devices and they can take their time, my students can take their time interacting with maps, videos, and other links related to the content that opens the world of exploration for my students. I know how deeply they uh, engage with the content by the questions they ask and the details in their visual models and drawings that they create. These drawings are also used as building blocks for them to create their own story maps. Some of my students have gone on to learn um, 
ArcGIS, uh, learn and integrate ArcGIS well beyond the, the capability of, of my own. Uh, they're using uh, data from the living atlas of the world, map viewer, um, and other uh, applications in ArcGIS. And I like to think that I kind of set them free to go ahead and create, explore, and uh, create uh, um, awesome multimedia content. My students now have access to 21st century tools to help connect them geographically to the larger world. Most importantly, these tools help my, student, my students to become keen observers and thinkers, unafraid to ask questions and to be a creative voice of change. And that's exactly what I want them to do. I want them to be able to impact change. <coughs> Excuse me. So to the participants of the challenge, please tell your ocean story boldly. Weave it in such a way that it stops people in their tracks and gets their attention to this very important issue of saving our ocean. And never underestimate the ability to impact someone with your story. In closing, I simply ask that everyone find meaningful ways to connect deeply and responsibly with the ocean from wherever you are. Thank you very much. Wow. I could just listen to Dawn and Sandra for hours, but we got more to do. So thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Sandra. That was a perfect setup for what's next because we get to turn to a couple of rock stars on the Story Maps team. Now, as they present, um, put your questions into the Q&A, hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. That's for questions. And we'll get to as many as we can at the end of their session. So with us today is Mr. Story Maps himself, Alan Carroll, who will be joined by one of the wizards on his team, Ashley Dew. Alan, it is so great to work with you on this awesome event, this 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Ocean Challenge. All yours. All right, thanks, Charlie. And of course, we've been working together for many years. So uh, as Charlie says, I'm Alan. I founded the Story Maps effort at Esri about nine and a half years ago. And before that, I spent 27 years at National Geographic. So you can imagine how excited I am about this, about this event and about the fact that these two great organizations are coming together in a bunch of ways these days. It's, it's just really, really thrilling to me. So let me share my screen and I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to give a brief uh, demo of uh, what story maps are. And, and then uh, then talk a little bit, uh, run through a nine uh, pointers, uh, little tips about storytelling. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Do, who's going to demo the builder. So I'm not gonna get into those details because she's gonna show you how cool and fun the Story Maps Builder is. Uh, I should also mention that there are other members of my team who are helping out here behind the scenes, helping answer questions. And Michelle, who worked uh, in, incredibly hard to, uh, to help organize this event and others across Esri. So many thanks to them. Uh, at any rate, um, what, is a, what is an ArcGIS Story Map? Well, they, they work on the web and they, they're like little self-contained websites and they combine interactive maps that are mostly made with our uh, Esri's technology and software with multimedia content. So with your photos, your videos, and even audio and text, of course, to tell stories about the world. Lots and lots of stories about pretty much any and every topic under the sun, many of them having to do with the oceans as you've already seen. Story maps work on uh, all screen sizes. They're best to author on big screens, but you can watch them uh, on any size screens. So we've worked really hard to make them work beautifully, just as beautifully on mobile devices as they do on larger screens. Um, and they incorporate interactive builders. And this is what Do's going to show you, but the heart of, and soul of our builder is what we call this block palette. So imagine the elements as building blocks that you can assemble into narratives. Um, it's been a very exciting 10 years. So we, we, we actually launched in 2012 
we're now uh, well over a million and a half. In fact, just about 1.8 million story maps are hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online, a number that, uh, that still kind of amazes and delights me, of course. Um, they're also really popular in the classroom. So about a third of those 1.8 million stories have been authored by teachers and students. So um, we're, we're very thrilled that, that they've resonated so well in the classroom. Story maps have proven to be a really engaging alternative to more traditional and static research papers, and they can be a kind of gateway for lots of young minds into the exciting realm of geography. Um, they're easy and fun to learn and use, especially for younger people who are digital natives. Uh, but if you're having any problems, uh, and we'll, we can point you to a bunch of different resources, uh, things like instructional story maps and blogs uh, and other uh, videos and other materials on how to, uh, how to make a story map. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to go quickly through a few pointers. I think Alex a little later is going to talk a little bit more specifically about maps, but this is more about sort of the general, some general ideas about storytelling. It's one thing to use the builder. That's the sort of mechanics of it, but it's, it's, but it's, it's like learning to drive a car. If you're going to drive well, it takes some practice. Um, so here, here are some of the things we've learned over the years. Um, so one, one is to start with a bang. And what I mean by that is that uh, it's good to think hard about your title and subtitle and the opening image for your story. So uh, I try hard to avoid a simple label. Uh, I never say story map about X. Uh, I like to think about how I can put an active verb into, into a title. I also think about how I can come up with a beautiful image or looping video like this one. Uh, and relate the title to the image and have them both kind of draw people into the story. Uh, second is to add a hero. By the way, not all of these pointers apply to all stories, so not every story needs or has a hero, but it's a good thing to think about. People love people, and stories that feature a main character or a small cast of characters like this one about uh, indigenous cultures around the Grand Canyon tend to be more engaging. Uh, but your hero need not be a human being. It might be a fish or a coral polyp or you name it, but uh, it's good to have that, that sort of specific individual to focus on. Number three is to give your story rhythm. Uh, and by that, I mean, if uh, often stories will have repeating sections or little chapters. And I like to work on, or at least think about having the structure within those sections be uh, kind of repeat things like, having a big opening image, an introductory paragraph, then maybe get into some maps and further explanatory texts. And then, then you repeat with the next section or location or uh, part of your narrative. Um, next, create a little world. And by that, I mean, uh, it's good to think about all the different elements of your story map and how they can work together uh, and, and start to look, look uh, have a unified look and feel. So this is a wonderful story about Menhaden, a, a fish of the Americas. And they, you can see it's only in black and white and red. So they kind of stripped away all sorts of unnecessary stuff. They made all the photographs black and white, but what results is a really beautiful and elegant and engaging story. Again, not, not right or appropriate for everybody, but it's, it can be a really uh, effective technique. Uh, number five, one size doesn't fit all. So of course I mentioned how stories work on various screen sizes. Uh, and it's important to remember that as you're building your story. Uh, we've worked hard to make the story look good across those different screen sizes, but it's good to check as you're building your story to make sure that it is working in those different, uh, different screen, not just sizes, but proportions. There's a preview tool in our builder that allows you very easily at any point in your authoring process to check what it looks, what your story is going to look like on, on say tablets or uh, mobile devices. Um, think big, think small, and by this I mean not 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 screen size so much as the elements of your story, a sort of close in look and a far away look. And often maps can provide that far away look. They can provide an overview that give a sense of patterns and of course of geography. But to bring those topics to life, it's usually very effective to zoom right in on a person or on a particular place or a landscape. And that contrast, that, that kind of zipping in and out from the surface of the planet, kind of to outer space to look at it can be a really effective way to bring a story to life. Um, maps, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to Alex on most of this, but maps can play many roles in stories. Uh, they don't all have to be elaborate interactive maps. A simple locator can be really effective. 
often a static map can be great because you, you can put in the map exactly what you want the readers to see and not distract them by making them pan and zoom or turn on other layers and stuff. Um, short and sweet, this is a one I have challenges with because of course, as I do a story, I, get, I fall in love with a subject and it starts to get longer and longer, but it's good to try to be pretty merciless and remember that short is sweet usually um, and that if you if you're if you're turning off your readers, it's very, very easy for them to to click away or open another tab and 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 say goodbye to your story. So try to keep things uh, concise, like this story that a colleague of mine, Ross, published on the cicada um, um, generation that's uh, just kind of uh, folded up its legs and burrowed back into the soil. Uh, finally, uh, try to make a ca call to action. Um, if you're going to inspire people about a topic, you want to you want to uh, give them more, and that more might simply be sending them to places where there's more information, uh, you know, YouTube video or an online article or you name it. But even better, you might send them to a place to volunteer for an organization or donate or advocate for something or sign a petition. So those are those are a few tips. I could name probably 50 more, but uh, I hope those are helpful. I'm going to put the, uh, I've sh shown you an abridged version. I'll put a, a link for the unabridged version in the chat window, and you're welcome to peruse it at your leisure. And happy storytelling. So that's that's it for me. I'm going to uh, turn it back to Charlie. Thanks. And actually, now it's time for Du to step in and take us on a journey through the techniques on this. Awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Alan. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Perfect. So the first thing I want to do before I jump into the builder is go to esri.com slash story maps. And this is our product homepage. So here, you can see a bunch of general information about the new ArcGIS story maps, but you can also go to some of the handy pages that we have available for you to peruse. The first is this Explore Stories page. It shows you best practice stories that we're focusing on as a team. And then it also allows you to kind of browse different stories by topic that may be relevant to the work that you're doing or some of the stories that you're looking to tell. The next thing I wanna highlight is this resources portion of our product page. So here we have a curated set of storytelling tips and tricks, like how we're doing things on our team, what we're using, and then also we're building up a repository of information that the team is creating. So any instructional materials that's coming out, any kind of live presentations we're doing, you can find that all here and dig into our instructions a little bit more. So from here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and launch the builder. I'm gonna click this blue button that says launch ArcGIS story maps, and it's gonna pull me into my stories homepage. And it's pulling me directly into this page because I've already logged in. If you haven't logged into your ArcGIS online organization, it will actually prompt a login. And here you can see some of the stories that I've been working on. And now here's a story that has some unpublished changes, right? So that means there's a published version of the story that's visible to the level of sharing that I've asked for it to be published to. But I've been making some updates in the back end and the builder that haven't gone live yet. I'm actually gonna go ahead and start a new story. I'm gonna click this deep turquoise button up here. And as I click it, it drops down a couple options for me. So the first one is I can either start a story from scratch or I can use one of these quick start templates, which are really handy. If you kind of know you know, what structure story, uh, story structure you want because it'll preload some of our immersive blocks. So you can start with things like sidecar, guided map tour, or explore map tour. And I would encourage you all to take some time to explore the different options here with your quick start tutorials and templates. 
So I'm gonna start a story from scratch. And now inside the builder, as you can see. And the first thing it wants me to do is title the story. So I'll add the topic for today, National Geographic 2021 Oceans Challenge, and add a short subtitle, Getting Started with ArcGIS Story Maps. I'm gonna go ahead and add a cover image. So I've gone ahead and made a folder of demo multimedia. And I'm gonna pull in this really nice picture of ice. But, you know, I'm not really a fan of the way this was pulled in. It's cutting a bit of it off. And so I'm gonna go up here to the top and click that gear icon. So I can change the orientation of where the focal point of my image is, is from, my cover. So now it's a little bit better. But, you know, I think I wanna change it a little more. So I'm gonna to go to this top bar of, uh, in the builder and click on design. And now I have all of these awesome design options. So I can make my image side by side. I can also make it full. And I happen to like the full image a little bit better. So I'm gonna leave it there because I think it really highlights this image a lot more. I also have the option to turn on things like navigation, which allows me to link down at the bottom here, any title text that I'll add and, I'll, and it'll show up automatically so folks can better navigate my story through navigation. I also have credits turned on just because it's a standard best practice because I'm going to use images, multimedia, or maps from other folks. I wanna make sure I'm giving them the proper attribution. And then I can also change my theme here. So right now it's in Summit, which is one of our six options that you see on the right-hand side. And these options are preset for, accessible, um, for accessibility. We've already created them to be visually accessible, meaning they have the proper contrasts and are easy to interpret for, to, for folks who may have different forms of colorblindness. And I can sort through all the different options there. Or I can take a look at the themes that I built by clicking on manage. So in September, we introduced the new theme builder and you can see all of the different themes that I kind of own here. I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at this dark mode, which I've created for this story. And so when you're in theme builder, you have the option to completely customize your story to fit your visual language. So in this case, I wanted a cool dark themed feel. And so I pulled in different colors and I've set a custom story background, this nice, very dark blue. I've set an accent color. Then I have a few optional accent colors. I'm also able to specify topography. And in this case, I wanted fonts that had kind of a thicker, bolder font. But whatever, whatever fits your style, you can really customize a lot with thousands of fonts to choose from. I've changed the button style so we can have kind of this really round circular button or we can have maybe rectangular edges if we wanted or even completely blunted oblong edge buttons. I can also take a look at how I want quotes displayed. So you have a lot of flexibility there. And then we finally have the option to change the links and separators. In this case, I've defaulted to nice simple lines for a clean look across the board. But I could also make it something a little more bold or use a custom image or graphic. And I can also change the position so I can orient it to the left, um, the middle or the right. And lastly, if I wanted to, I could upload a logo here, which will be super handy for folks because you can upload your logo or your visual direction and then automatically have a theme that you can apply directly from the builder. I'm gonna go ahead and publish this theme and go back to my story. When I click 
on browse themes. I can add in the theme I just published. And now you can see instantly the different topography, that nice little backstory or background color that matches really well. And already my story is starting to look a little better. But instead of kind of moving forward with this particular story, I'm actually gonna go ahead and go back to a story I was already working on where I've already pulled things together that I wanna go over with you. So now I'm in this new story. We have the title, the subtitle, our team name, the date as well. And I've gone and clicked edit story. So I'm in the builder. As we scroll down, we start to dig into some of the building blocks of ArcGIS story maps. Before I really start uh, to dig in, I wanna call your attention to this navigation. So I can move to different parts of this story by clicking on the different titles of the navigation. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is text in this story. So it's really easy to add text to your stories. All you have to do is click this blue button that shows up on the left hand and it opens what we call, what we're calling the block palette. And so our block palette is split up into a, a few different categories. You have your basic category, right? So your text, your graphics, which are gonna be buttons, separators, your media. So maps, images, videos, et cetera. And then our immersive blocks at the bottom. But for now, I'm gonna just add some nice text. the world's largest iceberg that has broken into. As you can see, it's kind of pulling in paragraph text. If I wanted to, I could make this a heading, a subheading, even a quote, any kind of list for, um, I'm just gonna, I'm fine with paragraph text, so I'm gonna keep it there. I'm gonna go ahead and maybe bold that text. And I'm not sure I wanna keep it this basic color. So I'm gonna go ahead and make it this purple accent color. So now we have a text with these effects that kind of set it apart from any other basic text. I think I'd like to add a quote here. So I'm going to go ahead and add text again. And I'll put in this quote by Ernest Hemingway. I'll change it to quote. And it's important to note that any sort of quote I pull in is going to match the formatting of my heading. So if you set different fonts for your header and your body font, your quotes will come out in that body font just slightly bigger. But I can also bold it, play around with the different parts of how I want this to display. And you know, quotes are a really great way to call attention to important parts of the text or top line things that you want your reader to really take away from the story. If all they're gonna do is, you know, skim through it. The next thing I wanna talk about are the graphics portion of the builder. When you're in the builder, you can add a few different graphics. The first one is the button feature, which allows me to create a call to action. So I can type in, learn more here and then add in the Ocean Challenges website. So now when anybody would click this button, they would say, hey, I wanna learn more about this year's Ocean Challenge. And if they click it, it'll automatically take them directly to that website. Buttons are really great for a multitude of reasons because you can add additional information, you can add call to actions. And the only thing I'll say about buttons is you want them more towards the end of the story so you don't pull the reader away from it. And then I also wanna show you how to add in a separator. While we played around with different separators in the theme builder, now you can see I have the separator that I can move around just by clicking and dragging on it. And separators are a really great way to provide an in, a visual indicator to your reader that you're either moving on to a new section 
or there's a break in thought or information and content. The next portion of this demo we're going to talk a little bit about is multimedia. So I mentioned that it's going to be your photos, your video, your audio. So I've added this image. I've already added some ice to this story. So I added a picture of penguins because, you know, Antarctica is not just about ice. There are also all kinds of life forms. So now we have this really nice image of penguins and it defaults to this small version, but I can also make it a little bit larger, full screen, or I can float it to the left of text. So as you can see, now it shows up on the left. I can add, I can put text on the right, which is really nice when you don't, you know, want an image to take up too much visual space, but you want it to be there for added information. I'm gonna go ahead and make it small again though. Also, when you're adding a video, it's the exact same workflow. You just open up the block palette, you click video, and you add a video. In this case, I've added an audio because I don't think the penguin experience would be complete understanding how noisy they actually are. So I've added an MP3 of penguin noise. So hopefully you can hear how loud a, a rookery is of penguins. So now we have an image, we have some audio, and I can add in a caption. These are cool penguins. Another exciting new media enhancement is image gallery. You can use it to batch upload images in the body of your story from your local files. You can use this block to showcase a set of related photos and each gallery supports a maximum of 12 images. You can choose, you can also choose from two different layout options, jigsaw or dynamic squares. I like dynamic squares. What's also really important is to mention that how accessible you want to make your content for your audience. With ArcGIS Story Maps, you're able to add alternative text to your media and maps like this. I'm gonna go ahead and add some alternative text to this image, a black and white image of a mountain in our area. Speaking of maps, the next portion of the builder I'm gonna go over is how to add maps to your story. So I go back into the block palette and under the media, I have this map option. And you know, this is a really interesting option. And there are a few different ways I can add maps to my story. So I can go into my maps. I can also take a look at what's going on in my organization. And then I can go over to the Living Atlas and add maps directly. From the Living Atlas is a selection of thousands of authoritative data layers and maps. In this case though, I'm actually gonna click this button on the top right. I'm gonna add an express map. This is a really great way to quickly add annotated maps. So now we have this really nice clean map so I can add points, lines, polygons, and text boxes. And I can also add arrows in just a matter of seconds. But in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and add a point. And the first thing I wanna do is search for a location in Chile, Tierra del Fuego. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this point to the map. You can also add another image here. So I'm gonna use this image of a sea lion. And so now, anybody who clicks on this point will now see a cute little sea lion. The next point I want to add is on the port area. Or maybe I just want to add a point to the Antarctic Peninsula. I'm going to go ahead and click somewhere over here. Now we have another point. We'll call it point two. 
for now. And I'll add an image of some mountains. to show more of the area. I also wanna illustrate my path. So maybe I'll draw an arrow, but my journey obviously didn't go completely straight through. So some, some of these islands, so we'll bend it around and I'll change the color to match. I also wanna add an annotation showing that this is my path. And in a matter of a few minutes, I've created a fully annotated map. Something else I wanna chat with you all about today are embeds. So there are a few different ways to add embedded content into your stories. In this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and paste a link. And as you can see, it defaults to a screen view embed. But in this case, I think this full embed is kind of clunky and it's not exactly optimized for this type of interaction. So I'm just gonna go and change it to card view because I don't want to overwhelm my reader. If I wanted to, I could edit the card and I could change the title, the description, the images, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it as is. The next thing I wanna go over are the special blocks. So I mentioned a few of them at the beginning, but the first one I wanna kind of walk you all through is a slideshow. So slideshow, offers you an immersive interactive experience. You can add media, you can add images, videos, maps. In this case, I kind of had a trend going, so I've added more penguins. And I've added another slide of an iceberg. I'm not really sure I love the placement of this text, so I'm gonna go ahead and move this to the right. And I don't love this panel, so I'm actually gonna make it transparent so we can see the image behind it. So now we have a slideshow that my reader can move through in a horizontal manner, which gives it a really nice way to break up some scroll fatigue and break up kind of that vertical scroll we've got going on right now. The next thing I wanna kind of move through is swipe. It's really great for comparison between changes over time, either through mapping, photography, or images. In this case, I've just compared a black and white image and I have, that I have and a full color image. So my reader can move back and forth, just kind of swipe through and see how this iceberg looks, black and white versus color. But this is a really great um, way to show how things have changed over time as well. Another option we have are our map tours. So when you have a map tour, you're initially prompted to either batch upload photos or start with an empty tour. In this case, I'm gonna choose an empty tour and then it asks me, do I want a guided tour or an explorer tour? So guided tour allows you to pull your reader through a series of tour points in a specified order. However, if you have a lot of tour points, you might wanna to move towards an explorer tour, which readers can kind of explore at their leisure. In this case, I only have a few things that I wanna add. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose guided tour. And then it's gonna ask me if I wanted a map focused or a media focused layout. In this case, I have some pretty great images. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose media focused. And as you can see, we already have this really helpful immersive block in our story. Below, I've added a tour with a few relevant images. I've gone ahead and added a location. I've done so by kind of panning, and I happen to know that this image was taken somewhere around here, and I've turned it to a current zoom level. And with this location, we can add some text here. 
I've also added another location to my tour near Port, Port La Croix and attached it to this really cute photo of a baby penguin here. Now we have a map tour that will kind of bounce around your reader to different locations and show different images. One of the newest capabilities we've added to the builder is one of my favorites called Timeline. With Timeline Block, it, provi it provides a fun and intuitive way to add chronological visualizations to your story in a more flexible and dynamic presentation than static images or purely text-based lists can offer. Storytellers can enter up to 20 events in a vertical chain and accompany each event with an image like I have here. You can also add a spacer in between events if you want to indicate that the particular lapse in time is longer is no longer relative, is longer than relative to others. The next portion of this demo is to talk to you all about map choreography. So I've added a sidecar below. And when you um, add a sidecar here, it's similar to the map tour. It's going to ask me if I want to choose from a floating panel, which is really great if I have immersive media like imagery, or I can have a docked panel, which is a great option to use if you have more information or text that you want to highlight. In this case, I've chosen a docked panel. I've thrown in some text that I wrote ahead of time around map choreography, and I've added in a map of historic iceberg locations. This is a web scene by John Nelson. This scene shows the historic prevalence of icebergs around the Antarctic Peninsula. There's actually a really massive glacier here that calves off a ton of icebergs, and I want to highlight that a bit more. So I've duplicated the first slide here. I edited where I wanted this map oriented. So I zoomed in and it allows me to show this, uh, this reader, this kind of zoomed out view and zoomed in view, showing kind of where all of these icebergs are coming from. As they scroll through, there's just kind of a seamless change in map location. Map choreography like this can be really powerful. So the last thing I kind of want to talk to you all about is the option to add background audio. So in this case, I could click these three buttons at the bottom and add background audio. At this moment, I only have penguin noise, which isn't particularly relevant to icebergs, but since I added into the sidecar, as my reader scrolls from this slide to this slide, they would hear penguins automatically playing. One of the last things I want to mention is the credits section at the very end. So I'm going to go ahead and thank the Story Maps team for helping me with this demo today. And I'm also going to call attention to this option to add attribution to the Penguin audio and the images because they are the parts of the demo that I didn't do myself. So I've added the title of the, the, of the photography, audio and credits to Liz Todd. Before all of it's published, you can also go into preview mode and see your finished story on multiple devices. That includes options to see how the story will be displayed on three different screen sizes and ratios, phones, tablets, and desktop browsers. And then from there, as I'm exiting the preview area, I can go ahead and publish our story. Awesome. And now we have a fully functioning demo story. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Wow, that was so awesome. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Du. This was just great.
And you guys play with those tools like it's you got a whole orchestra in your fingers and you're doing all kinds of wonderful things. Take some of us a little a little bit longer to get good at that. So now, folks, this is the time to make sure that you if you've got a question, drop that into the Q&A um, because there's in, there's a whole lot of uh, questions that have been asked. Wonderful questions. And uh, there are a lot that have been answered. And, and I see that there are some themes that make their way through these questions. And let's see. Uh, the, we've got uh, uh, the, the, the easiest question to answer is the, the question that uh, folks are asking about is, uh, I gotta go, is this gonna be recorded? And yes, this has been recorded. The recording will be made available. So you're going to uh, be able to watch all of these tips again and again and work your way through it. And so with that, I think the, uh, the key thing is now to start thinking about, gee, how do I get to participate? There was, there was a question that um, I also want to take a stab at um, as uh, my colleagues are jumping in and responding to these questions. It was so hard to kind of keep track of those and listen to all the cool tools. I picked up a couple of things from Dew's presentation. That was really neat. Um, but lots of people were asking about the age limit. And uh, gee, I wish it were a slightly different age limit. And you know, every now and then things have the, things have limits. And the story map challenge has varied over the years in terms of the age group that is being profiled. But if you don't fit, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything with it. You can still build your own story map to respond to the theme, or what might also be a really good opportunity is for you to work with a school or somebody in college who's just getting started. Help them be able to do this. Or if you're in elementary school or middle school, like some people who were in the chat were talking about, hey, could, could, could we do this in our little place? Absolutely put together a story map challenge for your class. Take the same themes and the same concepts, the same ideas, the same data, and do it for your school. Now, a lot of people have built up experience with story maps um, over the last several years. Uh, teachers have been using them Alan's comment, a, a third of the story maps created are coming from education. That's, that's pretty exciting. So think about doing a challenge, even if this doesn't fit your category. So even, if, even if you're not quite in this exact group. So let's see. Um, now. We need, uh, uh, let me think here. We need now to take a look at some of these other challenges that we had. Um, there was a question about accounts. Does uh, one of the team from Esri want to talk about the accounts? I can talk about that there are school accounts available. And if you're just looking for um, an, an account for a school and you don't have anything yet, esri.com slash schools will be the place where in a K-12 school, you can get software for your school for free. Any K-12 school around the world can have software for instruction for free from your Esri distributor. I see Michelle ready to jump in here. What have you got? 
Hello, Charlie. Thanks. Um, thanks for uh, sharing that information, especially about schools. Um, we actually have a great page on the challenge website. Um, I just dropped it in the chat. Um, it actually guides you through the process. So there are um, three different ways um, that you can actually uh, find out about the account. If you are a high school student or parent or teacher, there's an option and a, and a way for you to click um, and, and learn all the different account options for you. If you are a, high, a, a college student, uh, whether it's undergrad or graduate, we also had that question, can graduate students participate? Absolutely. Um, there is a button for you to click to find out all of your account options. And if you're a young professional, um, we have the same kind of thing. You can click on it and find out your account options. Uh, we do know that um, folks who are not in an academic institution right now may um, wonder, is there an account for me? Is there something free I can use during this challenge? Absolutely. So if you go to that uh, page, click on Young Professional, it'll show you um, the option and give you an option for signing up for a free account. That is an account that is only available during the challenge, but you can complete the, um, the story. You'll have access to all the different uh, features that you need to create wonderful maps and uh, pieces to put in your story um, all through that account. So um, check that out definitely for sure that uh, get started page is very helpful. Terrific. There's a there's always a lot in that and a lot to discover in the uh, story map challenge zone. So keep going back because sometimes you're not really thinking about the thing that you that that you think later and say, hey, I got to I got to go back and check that. There are also people have asked about different types of accounts, and it is important to pay attention to the type of account. Sometimes there are schools that are working with what we call a public account, and, and you can't do everything that you want with those. So pay attention to the information on the Story Maps Challenge, and if you're dealing with schools, go to also esri.com slash schools. That's where you what you'll find there. And now there were a number of questions, there were a, a few questions anyway, uh, that I saw about sharing. Sharing. And, hey, is this stuff, uh, is, is, is what I create automatically out there online? Somebody wanna take that one? Somebody wanna tackle the sharing part? Well, sure, Charlie. Uh, sorry. Ah, that's uh, great. That was yeah. So uh, there, there are three levels. If 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 you're part of an organization, there are three levels of sharing. So so one is actually kind of three and a half. So one is you can publish a story, but it's just visible to you. Uh, second, you can publish a story to your organization. And by what I mean by one half is that an organization might have lots of groups within it. So you can also specify the groups within your organization, say your campus or your 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 school uh, that, that are within your organization. And then finally, that they're shared to everybody. And that means everybody obviously in the in the world who has who has the link to your story can uh, can see and, and read and enjoy it. So when somebody wants to share it with a subgroup, they can do that and they have to determine if that is including people inside their organization and others outside their organization, they can still do that. That's right. And Charlie, I've dropped a link in the chat there um, that, um, that gives some very helpful information about um, different kinds of accounts, what's a group, how do I share with a group, how do I share across organizations, and that's been recently updated. So that's a really good starting point for people, especially teachers who are working with an organization and trying to figure out how do I get all my students sharing their work and working together. Um, it's a good start. Yeah, terrific. Now, one of the questions that I saw in several places was about Jeepers. Uh, how do I learn all of these different techniques? Uh, there must be some resources somewhere. And, and I can talk about the people who were asking from the, the young students side of life. 
But if uh, Alan and Michelle and others on the team can talk about uh, other ways to learn, that would be great. On the near end, what I, on the younger end, what I like to tell people to do is, as, as a great way to get started, is just look at a lot of good story maps. And if you just go to the story map site, storymaps.arcgis.com, you'll start seeing links to lots of really great story maps and seeing techniques that work. And then to talk with each other about why do these things work so that the students will understand and they'll say, hey, I, I really like this particular, the way the picture looks over here. And I like things big enough, or I like things smaller. Lots of different ways that people have done this. So getting to see and to talk about, vocalize about them is really important. Alan and Michelle, have you you're guys so right. got some? Yeah, you're so right, Charlie. I'm gonna defer to Michelle because she manages a lot of this stuff and she knows it like the back of her hand. So take it away, Michelle. Um, well, you know, I think Deuce said it best by showing you the actual website. You know, we have a website with inspiring stories by other um, storytellers. Um, we love to send people there first because um, we're inspired every day by the work that our community is making. So we know that you will be. Um, and then there's a resources page um, at the top of that. It does have really basic information of about just how do we start to plan a story and what makes a good story and, and kind of an outline, a place to start. And then um, a section for just getting started and then a whole uh, library of different resources, whether videos or blog posts or tutorials all listed there. Um, but if you are a teacher and looking specifically to reach younger um, audiences, I don't know, I want to pitch that over to Sandra if she's willing to, um, to, to give some tips there. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Yes, I'm happy to take that one on. Um, I'll just share a little bit how about how I got started with um, story maps. I literally just dived in and went to uh, RGS Learn and started taking some of the tutorials. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I also asked a lot of questions from the Esri community. And also partnered with other educators who were creating and developing story maps. Um, I don't know if we can put up some of the links, but um, there are resources from the LEARN team to uh, help educators to get started as well. I also have a collection of very basic story maps to, to help educators uh, learn to create curriculum and content if, if um, that's a concern as well. I've been chatting with a few people uh, in, in the chat about how to get started as an educator and is there mentor support? Yes, there is mentor support and I uh, have been giving some of those um, resources um, again in the chat. So aside from, uh, like you said, Michelle, just going to the, uh, the story maps page, uh, looking at some of the tutorials and the uh, introductory lessons. Um, I think the, the only way, the only other way is to, to partner and to, to seek a mentor and ask questions and just try. Um, it uh, can be a little daunting and overwhelming, but um, it helps to, to take a start, an initial start on your own, so you can see where exactly you need the help with. I think the app itself is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so go to the sites, uh, use some of the links that are shared in the, uh, in the chat and just go for it, really, just go for it. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yes, I put the, um, the learn, uh, the teach with GIS um, link in the chat. Um, I also put um, the wonderful resources in the page that is Sandra's page um, under that uh, teach with GIS that has her favorite tools, a great video and, um, and her information. And then we also specifically for this challenge created a hub site, it's called My Ocean Story um, and it's a hub and it has information about 
a host of different ocean topics, but with those topics, you have inspiring stories, you have maps, you have data, you have um, actual lessons from LEARN, our LEARN site. Um, so you have everything from the basics of what is ArcGIS online? How do I make a story map? How do I make a map to, you know, everything that Dawn was sharing, which is a little bit, seems a little bit more advanced, but when you start to read about it, it's all connected. Um, um, so definitely check that out as well. Hey, Michelle and Alan, there was a, a really interesting question that somebody asked about um, content from the internet. And there's so much great content from the internet. Uh, are there any issues surrounding the intellectual property and in using some of that in a story map? Oh yeah, <laughs> there are definitely issues. Um, it's, it's really important to, uh, to especially, well, not just especially for photographs, but for, but for all your content to be careful what you choose and how you use it uh, to make sure that you, you have permission to use it. It's, uh, often things are made of publicly available via Creative Commons. You can do an image search on Google and you can use a tool that filters your image searches for, for that, that kind of publicly available content. There are also free uh, image resources um, like uh, unsplash.com that, that are useful. But it's, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up, Charlie. It's, it's a kind of a boring topic, but a really important one to, to be really careful to, to use uh, images that are either out there in the public domain uh, or that you've gotten explicit permission for and to include credits for those images. So there's a uh, every single image uh, frame in a story map has a place you can add a, a credit and it appears as a little eye, uh, information icon up in the corner. And I dropped um, the link um, to an article. Um, Alan mentioned uh, great places to find free photos. Um, that article covers, you know, great tips about photography and photos to put into um, your stories, but also um, different links to places to find free photos and free videos that you can use um, in your stories. And it's really nice because throughout the story, not only can you upload links, but you can actually link directly to a photo or video online as well. So um, great resources out there for that. Hey, Charlie, before we pass it over um, to, uh, to Alex, uh, we received a really great question um, for, from someone who registered, um, who asked about, well, I live in a landlocked area, but I really would like to enter this challenge. You know, what are the options for me? How, how do I get started? Is this, is this challenge for me? And I would love to pass it to either Don or Sandra to answer that question. Yeah, that would be great. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this challenge is absolutely for you because this is an ocean planet. Uh, look at the beautiful globe uh, behind uh, Charlie uh, showing you that. And the ocean affects Minnesota, it affects North Dakota, it affects anywhere where you live. And uh, you can tell your own story. In fact, if you wanted to tell your own story about how the ocean is affecting you right now, I think that would be a very compelling story because the weather that you are experiencing from a, on a day-to-day -day basis, the climate uh, that you are experiencing over a longer time scale that is all due to to the ocean you might also aspire uh, to to work in the ocean or near the ocean so you can talk about that too some of the most famous oceanographers that i worked with or that i read their papers when i was in graduate school they were from the midwest they were not on an ocean but the especially because the data are so available now all of us can experience the ocean. All of us can do our part to educate each other about the ocean. It's all uh, at your fingertips. And so this, to me, is one of the reasons why I think we wanted to uh, offer this Story Maps challenge for, for exactly, for you, uh, exactly. So 
don't, boy, you shouldn't have gotten me started, so I, I'll stop now. <laughs> Sandra? Uh, nothing to add on to Dawn. I tell you, she said it completely. Uh, she said it completely. Um, you know, it's also important to, to know that, uh, and, and I'm sure that Dawn said this, that regardless of where we are, we are connected to the ocean. And I was uh, just looking at one of the, the comments in the chat that said, you know, in Arizona, we never get ocean homework. And <laughs> I thought, how sad is that? Uh, you know, it's it's time that we change that narrative and begin to talk about our human connection to the ocean. And the more that we do that, the more we are impelled to protect it. So, um, you know, I guess that's a challenge for my educators out there to uh, start uh, building an ocean literacy wherever you can in your curriculum. That's terrific. That's that's great. Well, we could probably spend another hour going through all different kinds of scenarios in terms of what it is that uh, people want to do in different uh, nuanced environments. Let's bring on Alex Tate, the geographer from National Geographic. Alex, great to see you. Hi, Charlie. Great to see you too. Great to see everybody. Thank you for uh, including me in this, uh, in this event. Um, and hello to everyone around the world that's uh, joined, uh, joined us for this webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, as uh, Charlie mentioned earlier, I am the geographer at National Geographic. And what that means is, well, of course I am a geographer as well as being the geographer and I'm a map maker uh, and a and a GIS technologist. And I am uh, the team lead for mapping and GIS at National Geographic Society. I am also the lead for our map policy. Um, and that is actually this year recently touched on really important ocean topics, like how many oceans are there in the world? Um, you may have seen uh, this news in June that National Geographic uh, recognized that there are five oceans, according to us and according to a lot of scientists. Of course, there's one world ocean. Um, and I love uh, Dawn's phrase about this being an ocean planet. Of course it is, and all the oceans are connected. But we recently sort of promoted the Southern Ocean to be recognized co-equally with all the other named oceans. Um, so that was an exciting event. And uh, there's even a TikTok that they convinced me to do about that. And then the last thing I'm really heavily involved in at National Geographic is our geography education program. So I work with our chief education, education officer, Vicki Phillips and her team. Um, and this challenge is really exciting for us. And this partnership with Esri on the Ocean Story Map Challenge is, is really exciting for engaging young explorers emerging explorers, young career, early career uh, explorers and geographers in looking at ocean science and sustainability. So we're really excited about that, excited about partnering with Alan and the Story Maps team and with Esri on this. And I really love this year's focus uh, on ocean science. Uh, it's an important thing that National Geographic supports our explorers like Sylvia Earle and Bob Ballard and Enrique Sala, people doing amazing work on protection, on science, and on exploration of the oceans. And of course, I love that it's about maps. I mean, maps are near and dear to my heart. I'll talk about them quite a bit. Um, but for National Geographic, this is really a sweet spot, combining geography and maps with storytelling. And as many of you know, through our magazine, our television uh, channels, we tell stories about the world. And those stories are often including maps. Maps have been a critical component of it. Of course, photography is very well known. Uh, our, our photographs and our photographers are very well known as well. So I wanna make a few remarks about telling stories with and through maps and the storytelling and the story maps um, tools uh, that you've seen. Uh, and you know, this is my third year doing the, uh, the judging for the Story Maps contest. It's been great to be part of the Sustainable Development Goals contest last year. 
and then two years ago working on another contest. I've seen a lot of story maps. So hopefully there's some, some information I can provide uh, about the process and maybe a few hints from a judge on what you should really pay attention to. So I'm gonna start off with why maps matter. Um, and here's a little inside tip, make sure your story map has maps in it and maps are an important component of it. That's one of the things that we're gonna be looking for is how you integrate maps and geographic data into your story. So a geographer that I really love, his name is Peter Haggett. Um, he says that much of geography is the art of the mappable and ocean science and su sustainability is geography. It's, it's looking at the science, it's looking at the human impact, the human environment interaction. Um, that's geography, and to be able to talk about it, to be able to present it, a lot of it is looking at what's mappable, what you can put into a map. So maps visualize data. They're really great at doing that. Maps show and reveal patterns in information. They're great at that. Maps provide context. And I think this is something that people sort of take for granted that you can put a map in context, you see other information, you see where in the world this is, how it relates to other things. And of course, people just love maps. Um, you know, there's this real love of maps uh, and people are experiencing them. I'm always amazed at how many maps end up as memes and go around the internet. Uh, people love maps. Um, and no less an authority than Edward Tufte, uh, who's a st statistician who's written a lot of books about visualizing information. He says, no other method for the display of statistical information is so powerful as a map. So maps matter. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, an example from National Geographic about a very effective map. This is a static map, um, was in National Geographic magazine about ocean plastics. And you can dive into this map and these cones of these rivers of trash coming out of different rivers around the world show the source of the plastic in the ocean. And then these pink circles show where this plastic is coming together and ending up, including the, the Pacific uh, garbage patches. So it's a fascinating way to see a sustainability issue, pollution in the oceans, how plastics are where they're coming from and where they're going. And there's no better way to show that than through a map. So I've got some tips, uh, sort of like uh, uh, Alan, uh, some of them actually over overlap nicely with what Alan said. And I think it's worth repeating a few of these. I'm calling them advisements. They're not rules. They're not you know, necessarily the only way to do things. I, I always encourage people to use mapping tools, including story map tools, use them, you know, creatively, find new ways of doing things. Definitely look at other people's stories, but use your own creativity. So advisement number one, have something to say. Make sure you focus on the story. Don't only put together impressive maps, photos, and videos. Make sure that you have something to say um, and that you focus on that as a reason to be doing this. Um, you want to create a consistent narrative and not jump around and try and do too much. You're not going to be able to cover ocean conservation every single topic or ocean science, everything about it. Make sure you narrow things enough so you have a consistent story. Um, and make sure it's individual to you and what you're doing. Again, keep it, keep it narrow. Um, I'm gonna just quickly go through a few uh, example stories that you can find. These are easy to, to search. Um, perhaps uh, our colleagues can, can find them and put the links in the chat. But one of our ocean explorers uh, at National Geographic, Asha DeVos, when the uh, ship ran aground on Sri Lanka's coast earlier this year, she set up a story map to be able to track the nurdles. And nurdles, of course, this is gonna get your attention right away. What is a nurdle? These are plastic pellets that spilled out of this ship and started ending up in the ocean and washing ashore. And she provided a way for people to actually go and log locations of where these were. So it was information about what had happened and then talk about a call to action. People were actually putting in reports of where the nurdles were so that they could be visualized on a map. Um, a few others that I actually pulled last year in relation to sustainable development goals 
Um, I would definitely encourage people to look at the UN website on uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, a lot of them, even if they aren't in the ocean's um, goal are related to it. Things like uh, flooding, uh, the land water interface with the ocean, um, weather satellites. Uh, uh, Dawn mentioned, you know, how weather ties the world together. And of course the oceans are a critical factor in world weather and world climate. Uh, and places like Greenland and Antarctica where melting water is creating this interface between fresh water and salt water, all part of our ocean world. All right, so number one, focus on your story. Number two, who is it for? Who's your audience? You need to think about who is gonna be seeing your story. And are you making it just for schools, for teaching? So Sandra had a lot of great information about how to use story maps in teaching. Or is it for policymakers? Do you have a very specific action that you want people to take? Create a protected area. You know, change your laws about pollution and levels of, you know, trash in, in the waterways? Or is it just for the general public to educate about a topic? This should be absolutely a key part of your planning and designing of your story map. So, and this leads to this idea that a little planning goes a long way. I know you wanna dive right in and I encourage you to look at the tools and, and, uh, and, and see how they work. But at some point you wanna think about taking a step back and think about what are the stages or steps or chapters of your narrative? How are you gonna put this together? How are you gonna engage people like Alan was talking about pull them into the story, tell them about something, and then maybe give them a call to action or a conclusion of some sort. So think about those narrative steps. Um, storyboarding, outlo outlining uh, your story um, will make a big difference in keeping things focused, um, keeping it concise. And I always talk about the power of the pencil for deeper thinking. When you take yourself away from the computer and you're actually drawing and sketching on a pad, uh, it, it, it engages a different part of the brain. And I think it gives you a little bit more time to think things through. So I always encourage that. Uh, number four, your text really matters. I know this is about maps. You're gonna have photographs and videos, but the text is super important. It's gonna carry the story and make sure you spend enough time um, writing the text, refining the text, editing, have people read it. I often see in these submissions to story maps contests, either too much or too little text, and then definitely text that has not seen the, seen the same amount of effort put into it as the graphic elements, which of course, you know, I'm a, I'm a cartographer. I love the graphic elements, but the text is critical. Uh, Alan was talking about focusing on the flow. You want to vary the pace. You want to make sure that you keep people engaged, make sure the story is moving. Otherwise, they're going to be clicking onto something else. Um, provide rests or small diversions so you're just not hitting them with constant barrage of images or too much text. Um, and then I really think it's important in story maps because it's the scrolling experience um, that you don't want to divert readers too far away. Um, you don't want them to spend, you, you can't expect them to spend a lot of time diving into an interactive map that's gonna require lots of layers and movement and a lot of work for them, um, unless that's the point of your story map. And at that point, you're sort of getting into more of a free exploration of data in a map. And it's a different experience, I think, than what the story map is best built for, which is more of a guided story, taking people through um, a story that you've created. And then provide a link out to a diversion. Don't include it as part of the experience. Um, make sure all of your elements support the story. Uh, it's easy to throw in lots of maps, graphics, photos, and videos that are sort of related, but and they're really cool, but maybe they aren't essential. Sometimes fewer and stronger graphics are best. And I think Alan made an exhortation about keeping things short and simple. Um, sometimes, uh, and some of the winners in past context have been much more focused and are not too expansive. 
Every now and then though, somebody does something that's expansive that's really amazing. So think about it. Uh, the last one I'm gonna mention is of course mapping. Follow cartographic best practices. And these are just a few highlights. Make sure that your screen pixel areas are maximizing the data that you can show. Make sure that the data are the most important thing. Don't put in really fascinating shaded relief and land cover and, and ocean depths if that's not critical to your story. Make sure that the data that you want people to see is the highest in your visual hierarchy, your vertical layering of information. Can't emphasize enough how important color is. You saw Alan's example of mostly monochrome story map with just the red. So think about how you're using hue, value, intensity, the aspects of color. And if you don't know about those, find out about them. Eliminate clutter, uh, really important in map making. And I highly recommend the uh, GIS technology body, body of knowledge website that is uh, put together by the University Consortium for GIS. I've written uh, one of the articles there. A lot of my colleagues in the mapping world have added um, their uh, articles about different aspects of cartography and visualization. So here's the website. I think uh, hopefully Michelle or someone can put it in the, in the chat as well. Um, it's a great in-depth website with all sorts of information about map making and visualization and other topics in GIS. So I wanna show what I think is a great example. This was put together um, in uh, partnership with Alan Carroll's team, Alan's uh, story maps team um, and Enrique Sala, who is one of our National Geographic explorers in residence. And the Pristine Seas program is a really impressive program. I love hearing Enrique talk about how one day he realized that all his academic work was writing the obituary of the ocean and he wanted to go do something. And what he wanted to go do was help establish marine protected areas around the world. And so he arranged a series of expeditions to improve science in these areas, and then very specifically to work with local governments to help establish marine protected areas. And this story map is all about that topic. And it has a great view of the globe and then the whole ocean and then into different specific areas. And I particularly like the way maps are integrated as still images in this case, showing some of the important distributions of biodiversity, fisheries, you know, the food production of the ocean, so that we can see how the ocean is being used and where areas of protection are gonna really help. And there's a very detailed interactive map that's only shown as a highlight in the story map, and then there's a link to go to that interactive map. It's not distracting from the story. So th I think that's a great example. I encourage you to take a look at it. And I just wanna finish with a note about young explorers, this focus on the age group in high school and uh, college uh, and university level, uh, what National Geographic Education Program is calling hashtag Gen Geo. Um, I think it's super important to be able to engage younger people in geography tools like GIS, like story maps. Um, wonderful example on our website about Alvania Lowen in the Seychelles. And this is one of the places that Enrique Sala and the Pristine Seas team visited. And I love this photo of National Geographic explorer Sylvia Earle with Alvania. And what Alvania has done is to act very strongly to help support ocean topic, ocean conservation in the Seychelles, cleaning up trash in particular and working with local and international groups to pr help protect the ocean environment in the Seychelles. So that's uh, my set of uh, recommendations and a little bit of background on National Geographic. So I'm really excited to take a look at all the story maps that are gonna be coming in about ocean science and conservation. Thanks. Alex, that was awesome. That was that that put everything in there, and I'm going to have to steal some of those uh, top seven tips for for some of my normal regular work. Thanks for that. That was that was terrific. And of course, 
that pristine seas uh, story map was 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 phenomenal. But wow, time flies when you're having having so much fun. I I just need to say thank you to our guest judges Dawn and Sandra and Alex and and Shelby out yonder and to Alan and Du and the rest of the Story Maps team and to all of the attendees. We still have gobs of attendees from all over. They're asking questions. This is terrific. So we hope you are inspired to submit a story to the Story Maps Ocean Challenge or that you'll share the challenge with somebody else and help them get into it. More stories, more submissions to this. That's what we need. And if they're looking for where to go, esri.com slash story map slash contest. You can see the link right there. And follow at ArcGIS Story Maps on Twitter. That's at ArcGIS Story Maps on Twitter for challenge updates and a link to the webinar recording. That's going to be available again within about a week. And that's it for now. So on behalf of National Geographic and Esri and this entire team, thank you all so much for joining us and being a part of the 2021 ArcGIS Story Maps Ocean Challenge. <laughs>